Hey guys, welcome to Southern Gal True Crime, where we feature missing persons, cold cases, solved cases, and more. And today, um, I have come across some uh, interesting articles um, about Ted Bundy. Um, they just came out recently um, on Oxygen.com. Um, the first one is um, some of Ted Bundy's exes have... Um, made some uh, comments about him talking about how it, how he acted and the way he was when they were dating him and also came across um, a little article about where his daughter is now um, evidently and I never knew that he had a daughter um, but apparently she was conceived during um, a prison visit um, so I thought it was interesting um, so I'm going to bring that to you. Um, but first, as always, we're going to start off with our missing person. And this comes from uh, NeverForgottenArkansas.org, which is the Arkansas um, Missing Persons Database. And our missing person is Georgia Banks, and she is only 14 years old. Um, she is a black female, um, 5'3", 130 pounds with brown eyes and black hair. She went missing from Jonesboro, Arkansas on April 2nd of this year. So it is um, a fresh case. I always try to bring these um, recent cases to you while they're still fresh and, uh, and um, so we can get this information out as quickly as possible. Um, she has no alias names, no identifying features. Um, here is a picture of Miss Georgia. Um, and I will put a link, as always, in the description box so you can share it. Please share it on social media, friends, family, any true crime group she may be in, um, just to get um, the information out there. And like I said, that's about all the information there is. So once again, there's her picture, um, Georgia Banks. If you do have any information, you can contact the Jonesboro Police Department at 870-935-5551. So please share, share, share. It's um, uh, important to get this information out there. That's the main goal of my little channel here is to uh, bring attention to missing persons and unsolved cases that um, don't get the national attention that these bigger cases do. Um, so please, um, if you would, please help support this channel um, because these um, missing persons and victims deserve to have their stories told just as much as the big cases that are all over the news. Um, so if you would please share the videos, um, subscribe to the channel, um, Hit the bell so you get notifications of when I upload new videos. Like I said, share our videos. Most importantly, your missing persons and unsolved case videos. Um, like I said, we're just a little channel just starting out. So all your support is very, very much appreciated. Okay, so with that very important information taken care of, we will get to Mr. Ted Bundy. And let me find, all right. And like I said, this comes from Oxygen.com and is a fairly recent article from March of this year. What did Ted Bundy's exes say about the serial killer after his initial arrest? And I found this very interesting and disturbing. Um, Ted Bundy's first love told Dr. Al Carlisle as part of a psychological evalu evaluation that, that she thought Bundy had been watching her. So now we're starting off very disturbing. All right, and there's a picture of Dr. Carlisle. Ted Bundy was once a charismatic law student, but there were hints of the serial killer's dark side even before his arrest. Bundy's former love interest, friends, and co-workers all revealed disturbing details of the man suspected of killing at least 30 women as part of a psychological evaluation by Utah State Prison 
psychologist Dr. Al Carlisle. Carlisle's recordings, once thought to be lost forever, were recently uncovered by his family after his death and served as the basis for Oxygen's new series, Violent Minds Killers on Tape. The recordings reveal terrifying new details about one of the country's most prolific serial killers. Carlisle was tasked with, con with conducting, conducting a 90-day psychological assessment of Bundy after the killer was convicted in 1976 of kidnapping Carol Durant from a Utah shopping mall in 1974. To carry out the attack, the law student posed as a police officer and convinced DeRoach to get into his car by telling her that he had spotted someone trying to break into her car and needed her to file a report at a police substation nearby. And uh, we know that that was one of um, Bundy's M.O.s, along with um, pretending that he was hurt, had a broken arm and such, and needed help moving furniture into a van, and he would get the victims close to the van, throw them in there, and, and do away with them. And there's a picture of Mr. Bundy. Um, once inside the vehicle, Bundy slapped handcuffs on her left arm, and the panicked teen managed to fight him off and jump from the car. She is one of the few women to encounter the killer and live to tell about it. Yet, when he was linked to the kidnapping in 1975, after he was caught with burglar burglary tools during a traffic stop, no one could have imagined his deadly past. Many who knew Bundy at the time insisted the personable aspiring attorney could have never carried out such a violent act, and Bundy himself insisted he was in innocent. Well, of course he did. Um, and like once again, it's uh, it, it's not uncommon that people who think they know Bundy or a serial killer, there's no way, you know, they say there's no way he was the nicest person in the world. There's no way he could have uh, committed these crimes. But time and time again, we see that they are capable and have committed um, these crimes. Um, to, de to help determine his sentence, the judge in Bundy's case tasked Carlisle with, de with determining whether Bundy had the propensity for violence as part of the prison's 90-day evaluation program. Carlisle conducted a battery of psychological tests on Bundy, but it was soon apparent that Bundy, whose IQ tested in the superior range, was capable, capable of outsmarting the traditional tools. Ted scored very low, very low on a personality test that measures levels of anger, depression, and anxiety, which would indicate no presence of an emotional problem, Carlisle wrote at the time. This didn't seem accurate, however, because the person who is and may be spending a lot of time in prison just doesn't score this low in all of these areas. Either Ted was telling the truth and he was trouble-free, or he was exceptionally good about lying about it. And my personal belief, and probably the truth, is that he was an exceptional liar. Just my opinion. To gain a more accurate portrait, Carlisle took the unusual step of talking with Bundy's mom, Louise, girlfriend, Elizabeth Klepfer, now often re referred to by her pen name, Elizabeth Kendall, former girlfriends and friends about his true nature. Bundy's mom, Louise, insisted that her son's personality was pretty much the same throughout his life. He, he's always been mature, and we've always been extremely proud of him, and he's a wonderful son, Louise said in recording of the call. And here is a picture of Dr. Carlisle, who conducted these um, interviews and evaluations. But Bundy's first love, a college girlfriend Carlisle referred to by the pseudonym Marjorie, described more unusual traits. The pair met while they were both in college. He was very much in love with her, and she is beautiful. She's, in, she's intelligent. She's a year, ahead, a year ahead, ahead of him in school, Carlisle said in a 2017 interview. 
According to Marjorie, Bundy hadn't had much contact with women before they started dating. The couple often argued after she discovered that he had been lying to her, she said. Did you see any other times or any other occasions where his behavior seemed weird or odd, Carlisle asked. Well, he was odd to begin with, Marjorie, Marjorie replied. You know, he, pop, he popped up all the time in weird places. She went on to tell Carlisle that Bundy would just show up on the street where she was. Now that, to me, is very creepy. Just popping up anywhere, kind of like a stalker situation. It was just a weird feeling, you know. Sometimes I felt like he was watching me. I just wasn't comfortable with the things he did, she said. He could have been living three lives, and I wouldn't know it. And Marjorie, Marjorie, Marjorie eventually ended the relationship. And I cannot say as I blame her, that was probably very, very smart on her part because she might have um, become one of his victims. He cried, you know. He really cried, she said, of Bundy's reaction. I mean, he was really falling apart over me. Now, in my opinion, I would tend to believe that was just an act um, to try to get her to stay with him. Who knows? Um, Bundy, Bundy, in my opinion, was a, a psychopath, narcissist, um, he would do anything to um, make people do what he wanted them to do. Once again, I'm not an expert on, you know, um, serial killers and the like. I'm just an armchair, not an armchair sleuth. I'm just always been interested in true crime. But uh, he was, uh, in my opinion, one of the worst. Carlisle would later theorize that this event is what helped push Bundy from fantasizing about violence to carrying it out himself. Now, I don't know if she means she feels guilt about this, but she is in no way responsible, breaking up with him responsible. He would have, in my opinion, he would have gone on to, to commit these crimes regardless. And... There's another picture of Bundy. In the time Ted was with Marjorie, he became overly dependent on her. When Marjorie called off the relationship, Ted experienced a very traumatic breakup. It shattered his personality, and he was never able to get over it, and he became more anxious and depressed than at any time in the past, Carlisle once wrote. So this may have been... Um, they always say that there is a trigger that causes someone to start killing. Um, so this may um, have been a trigger. Um, but like I said, in my opinion, he would have eventually started doing this regardless of what happened. Um, Kletfer was more supportive of her long-term boyfriend, describing him to Carlisle as witty. And that's another thing people have said. He was very witty, very personable which, in my opinion, was just an act. Um, we're just so compatible, compatible, and he was good with my child, Molly, she said, adding that although she thought he was unique, she wouldn't describe him as unusual. But Klepfer had her own doubts about Bundy, too, even if she didn't share them with Carlisle. After two women went missing from Lake Sammamish, her co-workers remarked that the Ted, seen in a sketch developed by witness accounts, looked striking, strikingly similar to Bundy, according to her, to her book, The Phantom Prince, My Life with Ted Bundy. Kletfer's suspicions grew deeper after she discovered some plaster of Paris at the back of a drawer in his apartment and a pair of crutches she believed he, he may have used to fake injuries and lure victims. Like I said, that's one thing he did. He had cast on his arm and would lure people, uh, women, to um, vehicles and uh, kidnap them. She also recounted a terrifying experience on Yakima River when Bundy had suddenly shoved her into the water and tried to hold her under. That is terrifying. 
His face had gone blank as though he was not there at all, she wrote in the book. Bundy later dismissed the incident as a joke. And if that was his idea of a joke, that is a, not a joke in my opinion. It's very disturbing. Klepfer eventually became so concerned she called law enforcement officers more than once to report her suspicions. Her story on the river with eerily sim was eerily similar to the account another woman shared with Carlisle. The woman, who Carlisle referred to by the pseudonym Sandy, dated Bundy in 1972 while he was still seeing Klepfer. Sandy was spending a day at the river with Bundy when he became obsessed with the idea that she climb a tree and jump into the river. That is sort of where the antagonism began. It grew during the day because that was a stupid thing to do and then to press for it, it didn't seem necessary at all, Sandy told Carlisle. Absolutely. Sandy finally jumped into the water from the shore, and Bundy jumped in, too, and began dunking her in the water, holding her head under for about a minute. So this is the second incident of him holding a woman's head under the water. So this may be working his way up to killing them, or maybe there was too many witnesses and he was afraid he would get caught but nonetheless once again very disturbing behavior i asked what are you trying to do drown me and he just laughed i thought he doesn't realize what he's doing she remembered in another terrifying incident sandy said bunny placed an arm on her throat during a sex act i was in sheer terror she said i was really frightened at that point Bundy's love interests weren't the only ones to get a glimpse of his darker side. Bundy's friend, Larry Vashal, told Carlisle that during a rafting trip, Bundy seemed to enjoy putting his friends in dangerous situations. I had always had Ted pegged as a gentleman's gentleman, but as, it, as this raft trip progressed, he got us into a couple of really tight situations. It was kind of like a deliverance kind of river trip. And if you've ever seen that movie, hmm, yeah. Um, Vashal said, refer, referencing the classic thriller movie, he puts us in under a waterfall one time and almost underturn, overturned the raft. So apparently he has, he had an obsession with water and trying to drown people. Sybil Ferris an elderly neighbor who once worked with Bundy at the Seattle Yacht Club also described him as a peculiar, peculiar boy who often borrowed her car for long trips at night. I was scared to death when he was gone. Something was up because he just wasn't running true to form of where he was going or what he was doing, she said. He was always kind of sneaking around. And there's another picture of Dr. Carlisle. Um, the accounts, along with his own observations and psychological tests, were enough to convince Carlisle that Bundy was violent enough to have committed the kidnapping. He concluded his personality was prone to the possibility of violence. Most definitely. Therefore, I cannot comfortably say he would be a good risk if probation is granted, Carlisle wrote in his report. As, as a result of Carlisle's findings, Bundy was given a 15-year sentence for DeRoche's kidnapping, but it wouldn't be the end of their contact. After being transferred to Colorado to be tried in the killing of 23-year-old Karen Campbell, Bundy continued to stay in contact with Carlisle, once sending him a Christmas card and even calling him after brashly escaping from a courthouse library. And we all know all, the, all know that story about his escape from the library. He just wanted to talk. He wanted to know what I thought of his escape, Carlisle recalled. Once again, to me, that screams of narcissism. Bundy openly admitted on the call that after running up the side of Aspen Mountain, 
he got caught in a very cold sleet storm that made him begin to regret his run from justice. To feel so sor sorry for you, Ted. Sorry, I'm being sarcastic. I went into a state of shock, and it was just a complete mind blow, mind blow for me, he told Carla on the phone. To have longed for freedom for so long, now like I was living my ultimate dream. All of a sudden, I was willing to throw it away because I was cold and hungry. <sighs> Lord. Bundy was captured days later, but he escaped a second time from the Garfield County Jail on December 30th, 1977. This time, he fled to Florida, where he viciously attacked the women of the Chi Omega sorority house, killing two and severely injuring two more. I think he couldn't stop from getting involved again with looking for victims, and Ted was so extre extremely hungry to kill again, Carlisle said in 2018. Bundy also cured, killed 12-year-old Kimberly Leach, who he abducted from her school in Live Oak, Florida, before he was arrested a final time. Carlisle continued to study Bundy in the years that would follow, analyzing his own interviews with Bundy and a 1986 interview Bundy did behind bars with forensic psychologist Art Norman. The big takeaway that Doc learned from studying Bundy was he understood the evolution of a killer, the path, pathways that they take to create themselves. Carlisle's longtime research assistant, Carrie Ann Drazuski Keller, said, Doc was trying to prove that his theory of the development of the violent mind happens in tiny steps. The descent is a spiral of thoughts, actions, smells, actions, reality, fantasy. It's all intertwined. Bundy died by execution. Um, he was sentenced to death by electric chair for his crimes on January 25th, 1989. My grandpa definitely saw something about Ted Bundy before the rest of the world did because my grandpa was one of the first people to see that Ted Bundy was truly capable of violence. Carlisle's granddaughter, Jessica Fowler, said in Violent Minds, Killers on Tape. All right, so that is some insight into Ted Bundy um, by Dr. Carlaw and people um, who dated um, and knew Bundy um, before and during his killings. So needless to say, um, very disturbing. And then I wanted to bring you... Yes, let me find it um, about his daughter. There it is. Ted Bundy's daughter. Where is she today? And this is from uh, March 30th of this year, so a fairly recent. Um, Ted Bundy's daughter. Where is she today? Rose Bundy was conceived after an alleged prison visit. Um, Ted Bundy is one of the most infamous serial killers, and he murdered at least 30 young women and girls. Mm -hmm. in <laughs> Bundy used his charms and boy-next-door good looks to conceal his heinous intentions and the fact that he was a killer and necrophile capable of abducting, mutilating, and abusing his victims. Ted Bundy was a complex man who somewhere along the line went wrong, said Jerry Blair, a state prosecutor in one of the murders, according to the New York Times. He killed for the sheer thrill of the act and the challenge of escaping his pursuers. Bundy was associated with as many as 36 killings, though authorities believe that number could be higher, and he was given the death penalty following his 1978 murders in Florida, um, he died in the electric chair in 1989. Over the years, we've learned a lot about the life of Ted Bundy, including the family he left behind. The serial killer had a wife named Carol Ann Boone, and while he was incarcerated, she gave birth to Rosa Johnson, Ted Bundy's daughter. 
um, Ted Bundy and Carol Ann Boone met while working at the Washington State Department of Emergency Services, according to The Only Living Witness, the true story of serial killer Ted Bundy. I liked Ted immediately. We hit it off well, she said, according to the book. He struck me as being a rather shy person with a lot more going on under the surface than what was on the surface. He certainly was more dignified and restrained than the more certifiable types around the office. He would participate in the silliness part way, but remember, he was a Republican. Boone became enamored by Bundy and later helped him when he got into legal trouble. According to Rolling Stone, Boone allegedly assisted in Bundy's 1977 escape from prison by smuggling in cash to her man. In fact, Bundy proposed to Boone in court in 1980. The Lovebirds had a courthouse wedding while Bundy was on trial for the murder of Kimberly Leach. A Florida law dictates that any marriage that takes place in front of a judge is legal, so Bundy and Boone held an impromptu ceremony in front of the jurors and judge on February, 19, February 9, 1980, according to the Associated Press. The next day, Bundy was sentenced to death by electrocution. Though physical contact between inmates and civilians was forbidden, Boone became pregnant more than a year later in September 1981. She later said that the guards didn't necessarily enforce the rules, allowing her and Bundy to consummate their marriage behind bars. Initially, she refused to tell anyone who the father was, with the Associated Press reporting that she told reporters it's nobody's business. After the first day, they just, they didn't care, Boone said, in a recording played in Ted Bundy, Conversations with a Killer. They walked in on us a couple of times. But over time, the relationship between Boone and Bundy began to crumble, according to Boone's friend, Diane Smith, in the Amazon docuseries, Ted Bundy Falling for a Killer. He was, he was exhausting, obsessive, demanding, moody, always needing... As if she didn't have an, enough to do, Smith said of Bundy, adding that eventually Boone was just tired of him. As it was becoming less likely Bundy would win a stay of execution, Smith said he called Boone and asked if he should start giving up information about where some of the bodies had been discarded to try to win more time before being executed. This was his way of telling her that there were bodies that he knew about and that he, had, that he had actually killed all these people, Smith said in the series. That call was just devastating for her. She was really angry. I'm surprised she talked to him at all. And he wanted to talk to Rosa and she said no. So the, there was no goodbye for Rosa. Where is Rosa Johnson, Ted Bundy's daughter, now? Boone divorced Bundy and stopped bringing his daughter to see him in prison. After the fallout, she and her daughter slipped out of the spotlight and little is known of the life they led after they left the charismatic killer behind. Um, Boone died in, Washington, in a Washington State retirement home in 2018, according to the docuseries. And it does not say where his daughter is now. Um, I really can't blame her because I, if anybody knew where she was, she would be hounded constantly. And that would just be um, not a very good life for her. All right. So I hope you enjoyed this little bit of information about uh, Mr. Ted Bundy. Um like I said, on this channel, I usually don't do a whole lot of the bigger crimes. I like to do the lesser-known crimes to try to bring attention from them. But I just thought these articles were uh, were very interesting. Um, but if you did like them, please like the video. Um, if you like what we do here at Southern Gal True Crime, please do subscribe. Um, hit that bell so you'll get notifications when I upload new videos. Please like and share our videos. Most importantly, our missing persons and unsolved case features because that is the most important thing i want to do here on my little channel 
is to bring um, awareness to these lesser known cases um, that don't get all the national attention that um, the big cases do. And so anytime you subscribe and like to share, it helps the algorithm and helps and helps um, these videos get um, seen more. Um, okay, so thank you for watching. Um, everyone, please take care and be safe out there. And I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.